Hi everyone, this is the second video for the 2021 HSC Maths Advanced Exam Solutions. In this video, we're going to look at the solutions to booklet one. So question 11, solve x plus x minus 1 all over 2 is equal to 9. This is just a simple equation and you should have been doing these since you're in year 9. I actually like to get rid of this too first, so I might do it a little bit different than you, but I am going to multiply every single term by 2 just to get rid of that denominator. And that will give us 2x plus 2 divided by 2 is 1. x take away 1 is equal to 18. And then collecting like terms, we get 3x take 1 is equal to 18. Take the 1 over, 3x is equal to 19. And dividing by 3, x is equal to 19 over 3. Question 12. A right angled triangle XYZ is cut from a semicircle of centre O. The length of the diameter XZ is 16 centimetres and angle YXZ is 30 degrees as shown in the diagram. Find the length of XY, so that's here, in centimetres correct to two decimal places. Now, this is just basic trigonometry. We actually want to find this length here, so let's just put a pronumeral there. And we can see from our trig, this is going to be the hypotenuse and this is adjacent, so it's going to be cos. So cos 30 is equal to adjacent, which is x, over the hypotenuse. Multiply both sides by 16. x is equal to 16 times cos 30. And if I just grab my calculator, because we need this to two decimal places, we have got 16 times cos 30, make sure your calculator is in degrees, is 13.856. So we'll round that to 13.86 centimetres. B, hence find the area of the shaded region in square centimetres correct to one decimal place. So we know that this area, this side length here is 13.856 centimetres. Now we need to find the area of this triangle here and the area of the semicircle and then subtract them. Now we can do the area of the triangle just by using a half a b sine c because I know this is a right angled triangle but we would actually need to know this side to use a half times base times height so it'll actually be quicker so a half times 13.856 you can see how I'm using an extra decimal place there for accuracy times 16 times sine 30 and into my calculator I get 16 times sine 30, of course, is a half. 55.426. And this is centimetres squared. Now we need the area. So this is area 2. Now we need the area of the semicircle. So I'm calling this whole thing a semicircle. Area 1. And it's going to be half because it is semicircle times pi times r squared. Now what is r here? It's this distance here. So it's 8. I'm putting that in the calculator. I get 0.5 times pi times 64. 100.531. And so our area will be the semicircle. Take away the triangle. Correct to one decimal place. 55.426 is 45.1 centimetres squared. Question 13. Find the exact gradient of the tangent to the curve y equals x, 10x at the point where x is equal to pi and 3. Now, what you need to do with these sorts of questions, with all these questions, is try and figure out what mathematics is required. Anytime we see these words, gradient of the tangent, this means derivative. So even if you don't know how to finish this off, let's start by differentiating this. So we've got y is equal to x tan x. Now immediately I can see that this is a product. It's u of x times v of x. So I'm going to start like this. u is equal to x, v is equal to tan x, and I'm going to do the derivatives. The derivative of x with respect to x is 1. The derivative of tan x is sec squared x. And so our derivative will be u times 
times v dash plus v times u dash. We want the exact gradient of the tangent to the curve at the point where x is equal to pi on 3. So we don't want the equation of the tangent or anything else. We actually just want to know what the gradient of the tangent is. Now remember, this is called the gradient function. It gives us the gradient of all the tangents to the curve. We want the one at x is equal to pi on 3, and we want it in exact form. So at x equals pi on 3, we get pi on 3 times sec squared. I'm going to do something sneaky here. Sec is 1 over cos, so let's do that. Plus tan pi on 3, and we'll skip this 1 here. All right, so that's pi on 3 times. Now cos pi on 3, that's cos 60, that's a half. So this is 1 divided by a half squared. A half squared is a quarter. Tan pi on 3, that's tan 60, that's root 3. Okay, I'm just going to do some division of fractions here. 1 divided by a quarter is 4, so I'm going to end up with 4 pi on 3 plus root 3, and that's actually the answer. Question 14. The first term of an arithmetic sequence is 5. The sum of the first 43 terms is 2021. What is the common difference? This is obviously a sequences and series question. It's an arithmetic sequence, so we're going to look up our reference sheet. We're going to find that the sum of n terms is n over 2, 2a plus n minus 1d. And this becomes just substitution into a formula. The sum of 43 terms is 2021, so n is 43, a is 5, n is 43, so n minus 1 is 42, times d, and we have an equation to solve. Let's take this 2 up and over, that gives us 4042 is equal to 43, 10 plus 42d. All right, I'm going to come up here. So let's divide both sides by that 43. That'll give us 10 plus 42d. What is that? 4042, oops, 4042 divided by 43 is 94. Thank goodness it's a whole number. Subtract 10 from both sides is 84. And dividing both sides by 42, that's 2. And that's our answer. Question 15, evaluate. The integral between negative 2 and 0 of the square root of 2x plus 4. All right, I'm going to rewrite this into index form. And this is a reverse chain rule. But there's nothing tricky about it, which is nice. All right, if I am going to integrate this, I'm going to integrate the outside first. So it's going to be 2x plus 4 raise this power by 1, gives us 3 over 2, divide by that new power. Also divide by the derivative of this inner function, which is 2. Okay, tidying this up, I've got 3 halves times 2, that cancels. I'm just going to rewrite it again. I might bring that 3 out the front, actually, as a third. So that doesn't confuse you. You can leave it in if you want to. All right, let's substitute the zero in. One third. Two times zero is zero, plus four is four. So four to the three halves, take away. Now substitute the negative two in. Two times negative two is negative four, plus four is zero. Okay, what have we got? One third times four to the three halves. You could put that in your calculator if you want to. But four to the power of a half is 2, 2 cubed is 8, our answer is 8 over 3. I'm not going to put units in because it hasn't asked for area, it's just asked us to evaluate the integral. Question 16, for what values of x is f of x equals x squared take away 2x cubed increasing? Now remember, if a function is increasing, its first derivative is greater than 0. So we want to start by differentiating. f dash of x is equal to 2x take away 6x squared. And we want to solve this. Now let's start by factorising. So 2x 
and then 1 take away 3x is greater than 0. And I can divide everything by 2. doesn't make a lot of difference, but never mind. So we want to solve a quadratic inequality. I'm going to start by graphing it just on a number line. And I want to know the zeros here. In other words, what makes 0? What makes 0 here, which is 0? And what makes 0 here? Now, if you can't see it straight away, then solve it. 1 is equal to 3x, x is equal to 1 third. Okay, so our zeros are 0 and 1 third. Now we're going to graph this, this here. Now this is a concave down parabola. We can tell because it's got a negative x squared term. So I'm just going to dot it through here, draw a concave down parabola. We want to know where this thing is greater than 0. Yeah. And that means above the x-axis. So here, so our solution is going to be anywhere between 0 and 1 third, but not including those two points. So you can either write it like this, or you can write 0 is less than x is less than 1 third. Question 17. For a sample of 17 inland towns in Australia, the height above sea level, x metres, and the average maximum daily temperature, y degrees Celsius, were recorded. The graph shows the data as well as the regression line, a regression line. The equation of the regression line is yx 29.2 take away 0.011x, and the correlation coefficient is r is equal to negative 0.494. By using the equation of the regression line, predict the average maximum daily temperature in degrees Celsius for a town that is 540 metres above sea level. Give your answer correct to one decimal place. So we just need to substitute into the equation. But we'll just check our units. We've got 540 metres and x is in metres, so we're good to go. y is equal to 29.2. Take away 0 0.011 times 540. And into the calculator, we get... 29.2 take away 0 0.011 times 540 is 23.26 to one decimal place is 23.3 degrees Celsius. The gradient of the regression line is negative 0.011. Interpret the value of this gradient in the given context. Now remember gradient is a rate. It's something per something. And it's what's happening here as we move across the graph, as the height above sea level increases. The temperature is dropping, and in fact it's dropping 0 0.011 degrees Celsius per metre that we get higher. So to interpret it, you can either write it mathematically like this. It is negative 0 0.011 degrees Celsius per metre. Or you could write it in words, that we decrease in temperature by 0 0.011 degrees Celsius per metre um, ascending. The graph below shows the relationship between the latitude, x degrees south, and the average maximum daily temperature, y degrees Celsius, for the same 17 towns as well as the regression line. The equation of the regression line is y equals 45.6 take away 0.683x, and the correlation coefficient is r is equal to negative 0 0.897. Another inland town in Australia is 540 metres above sea level. Its latitude is 28 degrees south. Which measurement, height above sea level or latitude, would be better to use to predict the town's average maximum daily temperature and give a reason for your answer? So there's two things to consider here. So whether 540 metres and 28 degrees south lie within the poles of the data and they both do if you look back at the graphs they're like bang smack in the middle so that's not an issue here neither of them is unreliable we're not extrapolating so it must come down to correlation coefficient if we have a look here this one here is the height above sea level the correlation coefficient is much weaker than this one which is about latitude so we should definitely use this and the reason is because the relationship is much stronger. The correlation coefficient is closer to negative 1. Question 18. The diagram shows the triangle ABC. AC is equal to 25 centimetres. BC is equal to 16 centimetres. And angle BAC is 28 degrees. 
An angle ABC is obtuse. So this is already making me think this might be an ambiguous case question with the sign rule. Let's see how we go. Find the size of the obtuse angle ABC, correct to the nearest degree. So let's put pronumeral in there. We'll just put theta in here and see if we can match up sides. So we've got a side and an opposite angle and another side and an opposite angle. So we're going to do sine theta over its opposite side is equal to sine 28 over its opposite side. Okay, take the 25 up here. Sine theta is equal to 25 sine 28 over 16. And grab a calculator again. So we've got 25 times sine 28 over 16 and that gives us 0 0.7335. Now we're going to use inverse sine, but remember that's going to give us an acute angle. So I'm just going to go inverse sine of that answer on my calculator, which is 47.18. I'll just write that up there. Now that's the acute angle. To get the obtuse angle, we want to go 180 minus that. And that's going to give us, we want the nearest degree. So 133 degrees. Question 19. Without using calculus, sketch the graph of y equals 2 plus 1 on x plus 4, showing the asymptotes and the x and y intercepts. So firstly, what type of graph is this? This is a hyperbola. You can tell because it's got an x on the denominator. It's going to have two asymptotes. The basic hyperbola, y equals 1 on x, looks like this. So we're expecting the same kind of shape. Let's start with the asymptotes. Now, the vertical asymptote is the easiest. We can't have the denominator of 0, so x cannot equal negative 4. So that's the asymptote. And the y asymptote is going to be 2. And the reason is this can never equal 0. There's nothing I can put in for x that will make that fraction equal to 0. If that can't equal 0, y can't equal 2. So there's our asymptotes. Now the intercepts. The y-intercept is the easiest. occurs when x is equal to 0. So let's substitute that in. y is equal to 2 plus 1 quarter, which is 2 and a quarter. And the x-intercept occurs when y is equal to 0. Solve this equation. 0 is equal to 2 plus 1 on x plus 4. So negative 2 is equal to 1 on x plus 4. Switch these. x plus 4 is equal to negative 1 half. And so x, sorry I'm running out of room, is equal to negative 1 half. Take away 4, it's just negative 4 and a half. All right, we're ready to graph it. Now my graph's not going to be very good. You can draw a better one than this because you will have a ruler. Start with the asymptotes. They are at negative 4. So here. and positive 2. And watch your scale on the axis. OK, I need a bit more room. Now we'll plot these points. The y-intercept occurs at 2 and a quarter, so that's about there. And the x-intercept occurs at negative 4 and a half, so that's about here. All right, let's draw this graph in. It's going to look something like this. And then down through here, and like that. And then we should label the asymptotes and the x and y intercepts. So just label these points here 0, 2 and a quarter, and negative 4 and a half, 0. And that's it. Question 20 For what values of x in the interval 0 to pi of 4? Does the line y equals 1 intersect the graph of y equals 2 sine 4x? Now you can graph this and then just figure out the values, but you're going to have to end up doing simultaneous equations eventually, so I'm going to start with that. Uh, if y is equal to 1 and y is equal to 2 sine 4x, then 1 is equal to 2 sine 4x. Divide both sides by 2, and I'm turning it around. 
And so 4x will equal inverse sine of a half, which is equal to 30 degrees, which is pi on 6. Now remember, we're going to need a few extra values because sine is periodic. So just between 0 and whatever its period is, it's going to be twice here. In fact, let's work out its period. So I've got this nice little formula, which hopefully you know, is 2 pi on n. And n is the value in front of the x. So 2 pi on 4, which is pi on 2. OK, so this is going to go through its entire cycle in pi on 2. And we only want it in the interval 0 to pi on 4. So here's our first quadrant, second quadrant, third quadrant, fourth quadrant. We want to be in here and in here. So just two values. OK, remember this is going to be, this is pi on 6 here. This one will be pi minus pi on 6, which is 5 pi on 6. All right, we're nearly there. Divide everything by 4. x is equal to pi on 24 and 5 pi on 24, and that's the answer. Question 21. Consider the graph of y equals f of x as shown. Sketch the graph of y equals 4 lots of f of 2 of x, showing the x-intercepts and the coordinates of the turning point. So we've got two dilations here. We have a vertical dilation, which is going to stretch it out. So it'll take this whole thing here and it'll make this come way down. It won't affect there and there because we're, we're stretching the y coordinate. So 4 lots of 0 is 0 and the same here. But this negative 8 will become negative 32. Now this here, this makes the whole graph go twice as fast or it compresses it. We just did that, didn't we, with that sine curve. So instead of being all the way through here, this is all going to shift in. So that 4 is going to become 2, and the 6 will become 3. Now, my graph will be terrible. You will hopefully draw a better one than I will. So this is 4, um, 2, and 3. And down here, somewhere or other, at negative 32. It's going to go like this. Well, it's, as I said, it's a terrible graph that's meant to be straight there. And this will be squished in too. And then we've just got to show this point to negative 32. Question 22. A random variable is normally distributed with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. Table gives the probability that this random variable lies between 0 and z for different values of z. The probability values given in the table for different values of z are represented by the shaded area in the diagram. And that just means that this area here, these probabilities, represent this area between 0 and some positive value of z. Using the table, find the probability that a value from a random variable that is normally distributed with mean 0 and standard deviation 1 lies between 0 0.1 and 0 0.5. Now, this is a really easy question. It's probably the easiest question on the entire paper. And a lot of people don't attempt this because they think it's hard. It's not hard. It's just strange and you're not used to it. I'll draw this up and show you what's going on. This is not drawn to scale. The question asks us to find this area here. So can you see that we can find that by doing the area between 0 and 0 0.5, in other words, that number, take away the area between 0 and 0 0.1, which is this number. So it comes down to decimal subtraction, would you believe? So our probability is going to be 0 0.1915, take away 0 0.0398, I won't do this one by hand. I'll just grab the calculator. It's 0.1915, take away 0 0.0398, which is 0 0.1517. B. Birth weights are normally distributed with a mean of 3,300 grams and a standard deviation of 570 grams. By first calculating a z-score, find out how many babies out of 1,000 born are expected to have a birth weight greater than 3,528 grams. All right, so we'll start with our z-score. And our formula is x take away mu divided by sigma. So x is 3,528. Take away the mean. 
and then divided by 570. If we put that in the calculator, we are going to get 3528, take away 33, naught, naught, all over 570, which is 2 fifths or 0 0.4. And so we want to know how many are expected to have a birth weight greater than that. So if this is 0 0.4 here, we want to know this. So having a look here, this part here is 0 0.1554. The whole area there is 0 0.5. So to find the part that I want, the probability is just going to be 0 0.5 take away 0 0.1554. And on the calculator, 0 0.5 take away 0.1554, which is 0.3446. 0.3446. We want to know how many babies out of a thousand born are going to have a birth weight greater than um, 3,528 grams. So we just need to multiply that 0 0.3446 by a thousand, which of course we move our decimal place over three positions is 344.6 babies or 345 babies. And that's the answer. Question 23. Population P, which is initially 5,000, varies according to the formula P is equal to 5,000 multiplied by B to the negative T on 10. B is a positive constant, T is the time in years, and T is greater than or equal to zero. The population is 1,250 after 20 years. Find the value of T correct to one decimal place for which the instantaneous rate of decrease is 30 people per year. All right, we've got a bit to do. We're going to start by working out what B is equal to. And we've been given a pair of values so that we can do that. So the population is 1250 when t is equal to 20. Dividing both sides by 5000, I get a quarter or 0 0.25 is equal to b to the negative 2. All right, I'm going to do the square root of both sides. Square root of a quarter is actually a half. You can put it in your calculator if you want to. And the square root of b squared is just b, but I've still got that negative power there. All right, that's equal to 1 over b. And switching these, b is equal to 1 divided by 0 0.5, and 1 divided by 0 0.5 is 2. And so p is equal to 5,000 times 2 to the negative t on 10. Now let's work out this next part. The instantaneous rate of decrease. That, of course, is the derivative, so dp dt. Now you can see here how I've written the formula up here, so we can just follow it. And in this case, a is the base, which is going to be 2, and f of x is actually f of t is negative t on 10. All right, off we go. The 5,000 will just hang around, times log a, so that's log 2, times f dashed of x, or f dashed of t. The derivative of negative t on 10 is negative 1 tenth, and then times a to the f of x, so that's just 2 to the negative t on 10. All right, we want to know the value of t when this rate of decrease is 30 people per year. So that's going to be negative 30 is equal to 5,000 times ln 2 times negative a tenth times 2 to the negative t on 10. All right, we've got an equation to solve. Let's start by cancelling that and that and these negatives. All right, so we've got 30 is equal to 500 ln 2 times 2 to the negative t on 10. Divide both sides by 500 ln 2. And at this point, I'm going to turn this into a decimal. So just putting it in my calculator, I get 0 0.08656. And that's equal to 2 to the negative t on 10. Let's log both sides, which is ln 2 to the negative t on 10. And bringing this down, I get, let's just log that. Still got it in my calculator, negative 2. 0.4469 equals negative t on 10 times, what's log 2? 0 
0.6931. All right. Dividing both sides by 0 0.6931 and multiplying by 10. All right, let's see. So 2.4469 times 10 divided by 0 0.6931. And of course, those negatives are going to cancel out. T to one decimal place yeah, is 35.3 years. And that's the answer. Question 24. The curve y equals 3 over x minus 1 intersects the line y equals 3 over 2x at the point 2, 3. You can see that on the diagram. The region bounded by the curve y equals 3 over x minus 1 and the line y equals 3 over 2x, the x-axis, and the line x equals 4 is shaded. Find the exact area of the region. So I'm going to split this into two just down through here. And we know that the x-coordinate there is 2. So our area is going to be integral between 0 and 2 of this first function, which is y is equal to 3 over 2x. How do I know that? Because it's a straight line. Plus the integral between 2 and 4 of this one here, which must be the other one, 3 over x minus 1 dx. We don't need to worry about doing the absolute value or anything like that because they're obviously both going to be positive. So we just need to work this out. I'm going to throw these three halves out the front. Integrate x gives us x squared on 2 between 0 and 2 plus bring the 3 out the front. This is going to be ln of x minus 1 between 2 and 4. Now we just need to substitute it all in and work it out. I've got three halves times 2 squared is 4 over 2. Take away 0. Actually I'll put that in plus 3. Learn 4 take away 1 is 3. Take away learn 2 take away 1 is 1. That's 0. So that's gone. And we want the exact area. So we want to just work this out. So I've got 12 over 4 is 3 plus 3 learn 3. Question 25. The table of future value interest factors for an annuity of $1 is shown. Simone deposits $1,000 into a savings account at the end of each year for eight years. The interest rate is 0.75% per annum compounded annually. That's important. So that means we don't need to make any adjustments. We want 0.75 and we want eight years. After the eighth deposit, Simone stops making deposits but leaves the money in the savings in the savings account. The money in the savings account then earns interest at 1.25% per annum compounding annually annually for a further two years. Find the amount of money in Simone's savings account at the end of 10 years. All right, we've got two bits to do here. This is the first bit, which is the annuity, and then this is the second bit. So $1,000. These tables, of course, are for $1. So we're just going to take this number here and multiply it by 1,000. So that's going to be step one. Um, 1,000 times by 82132. And moving that decimal place over three places, she has got $8,213.20 at the end of the eight years. After the eighth deposit, she stops making deposits, leaves the money in the account, and then it earns interest at 1.25% per annum. So now we want to do just some compound interest. So 8213.2, 1 plus 1.25%. It's going to be for a further two years. And on my calculator, 8213.2 times 1.0125 to the power of 2 is $8,419.81. Question 26. The particle is shot vertically upwards from a point 100 metres above ground level. The position of the particle y meters above the ground after t seconds is given by y of t is equal to negative 5t squared plus 70t plus 100. Find the maximum height above ground level reached by the particle. So let's just draw a quick diagram. We've got ground level there and we've got 100 meters and the particle is launched from here and it'll go like that. If we're finding the maximum height above ground level, we want this turning point here. And the way to find that is to differentiate 
and put the derivative equal to zero. We'll have a look at that in a minute. So we've got negative 10t plus 70, and we want to put that equal to zero. Now remember that our first derivative is the gradient function. It tells us the gradient of all the tangents. And the tangent here, the gradient is zero. So simple equation to solve, 10t is equal to 70, t is equal to seven seconds. Let's check and see whether we have answered the question. Find the maximum height above the ground level reached by the particle. No, we've found when it turns, not what the height is. So we need to substitute back into the formula for the height, which is going to be y of seven equals negative five times seven squared plus 70 times seven plus 100. And on our calculator, we get negative five times 49 plus 70 times seven plus 100 is 345 meters, 345 meters. Part B, find the velocity of the particle in meters per second immediately before it hits the ground and leave your answer in a, the form A root B where A and B are integers. Okay, so I've got a bit to do here. We wanna find this immediately before it hits the ground. So we need to know when it hits the ground. Coming back to our little diagram, that's going to be when y is equal to zero. So we'll start off by solving this equal to zero. Now I'm going to divide through here by negative five, just to make life a little bit easier. 70 divided by negative five is negative 14. 100 divided by negative five is negative 20. Now, given that they've said this, I reckon we cannot factorise this, so I'm going to use the quadratic formula. 14 plus or minus square root of 14 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 20, all over 2 times 1. Now, here's the thing. We don't actually need this negative here. I'm going to get rid of it. Because we want this value here. The negative t value would have been this one over here, and there's no such thing as negative time. So we can ignore that. Let's tidy this up. 14 plus the square root of, let's work that out, 14 squared plus 4 times 20 is 276. I reckon that can be reduced down all over 2. So 14 divided by 2 is 7 plus what is a perfect square that goes into 276? Let's just divide it by 4. And it gives us 69, so it's 2 root 69 on 2, which is 7 plus root 69. Okay, now we haven't answered the question. We found when it hits the ground. We need the velocity, so we did that before when we did y dashed of t. Just do it again, minus 10t plus 70, and we want to know the velocity at 7 plus root 69. It's going to get a bit messy. Negative 10, 7 plus root 69 plus 70 equals negative 70 minus 10 root 69 plus 70. Cancel out, and our answer is negative 10 root 69. So A is equal to negative 10, and B is equal to 69. Question 27. Kenzo has a solar powered phone charger. Its power P can be modeled by the function P of T equals 400 sine of pi on 12 T and T is in between zero and 12. T is the number of hours after sunrise. Sketch the graph of P for zero up to 12. All right, we're gonna start off by having a look at what these mean. So this 400 is gonna change the amplitude. It's gonna stretch it out between negative 400 and positive 400. And this here is gonna change the period. Now remember that formula. So our period is equal to two pi over n, and n in this case is pi on 12. So two pi divided by pi on 12, which is two pi times 12 on pi, which gives us 24. Okay, so the period is 24. However, we only want to sketch it between 0 and 12. So we know what sine does between 0 and pi. It just does this. So that's going to be 12 
this is 6, and this up here is 400. Let's label our axes P of T, and this is T. Power is the rate of change of energy, hence the amount of energy E units generated by the solar powered phone charger from T equals A to T equals B, where 0 is less than or equal to A, less than or equal to B, less than or equal to 12, is given by that formula. Show that E is equal to this. All right, so what we want to do is set up this integral. So E is going to be equal to the integral between A and B of 400 sine pi on 12t dt. Okay, let's take this 400 out. Now this is going to be a reverse chain rule, so we'll start with the outer function, which is sine. The integral of sine is negative cos. And we want to now divide by the derivative of the inner function, which is pi on 12, in between a and b. All right, up here. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to, I'm going to get take it out the front, I mean. So 400 divided by pi on 12 is the same as 400 times 12 on pi. And I'll bring the negative out as well. Let's just rewrite it for a second. Cos pi on 12t between a and b. Okay, equals, we got negative 4,800 on pi. Now let's substitute in cos of b pi on 12, take away cos a pi on 12. Let's see where we need to get to. Okay, all I can see is that I've got a negative out the front. This is what I'm going to do. Just flip these around. Negative cos a pi on 12 plus cos b pi on 12, and then factorise that negative out. So negative times a negative makes a positive, 4800 over pi. Cos a pi on 12, take cos b pi on 12. C. To make a phone call, a phone battery needs at least 300 units of energy. Kenzo woke up three hours after sunrise, found his phone battery had no units of energy. He immediately began to use his solar powered charger to charge his phone battery. Find the least amount of time he needed to wait before he could make a phone call. Give your answer correct to the nearest minute. So we are going to use our formula here. Before we do, we need to just clarify what A and B are. They are times after sunrise. And the previous question, it said that zero is less than or equal to A, is less than or equal to B, is less than or equal to 12. And zero is sunrise. So A is three. All right, we're ready to solve a trig equation. The energy is 300 is equal to 4,800 on pi. Cos of three pi on 12, take cos B pi on 12. All right, taking this over, we get 300 pi on 4,800 is equal to cos pi on 4, which we know, take cos b pi on 12. I'm going to turn this around and make cos b pi on 12 the subject. Cos pi on 4 is 1 on root 2. Take away, what can we do here? 300 into 4,800 goes 16 times. That's pi on 16. All right, up here. So b pi on 12 is equal to inverse cos of 1 on root 2, take pi on 16. And then taking the pi on 12 over, we get b is equal to 12 on pi inverse cos 1 on root 2, take pi on 16. Now we're just going to put this in the calculator, but guess what? It has to be in radians. Do you know why? Because this pi here it wasn't meant to be that dark, but never mind. So in our calculator, I'm going to make sure it's in radians. It is 12 divided by pi times inverse cos. 1 divided by root 2, take away pi divided by 16. Oops. Bracket is 3.95. Now let's just try and interpret this answer. I'm actually going to use the bubble button. Hopefully you know that button. It looks like this. It's going to convert it into time for me. So it's 3 hours and 57 minutes. Now, 
this is 3 here, and this one here is 3 hours and 57 minutes. So how long has it taken to charge the phone? 57 minutes. That's actually the answer. D. The next day, Kenzo woke up six hours after sunrise and again found his phone battery was dead. He immediately began to use his solar-powered charger to charge the phone battery. Would it take more time or less time or the same amount of time compared to the answer in Part C to charge his phone battery in order to make a phone call? All right, so remember the integral is the area under a curve. So in Part C, he woke three hours after sunrise and it took 57 minutes to charge that phone. So that there is 300 units. On this day, or the next day, he woke six hours. So is it gonna take more time or less time or the same amount of time compared to part C to charge the battery? Can you see it's gonna take less time because this is a higher point in the graph than these two? So our answer is going to be, it's going to take less time, reason, and draw the graph if you want to, so that you can show what you're talking about. Um, it's going to take less time because we are at a higher point on the curve. Question 28. The region bounded by the graph of the function f of x equals 8 take away 2 to the power of x and the coordinate axis is shown. Show that the exact area of the shaded region is given by 24 take away 7 on ln 2. Now we can either work out the area bounded by the x-axis or bounded by the y-axis. It's easier to work it out bounded by the x-axis, but if you get into difficulty, and you can't proceed because you can't integrate it, then try the alternative. But let's start with the x-axis. So for that, we're going to need to know this x-intercept here because we don't know it. x-intercepts occur when y is equal to 0. 0 is equal to 8 take away 2 to the x. 8 is equal to 2 to the x. x is equal to 3. Let's set up the integrals. The area is equal to integral between 0 and 3 of 8 take away 2 to the x dx and integrating we get 8x take away 2 to the x divided by ln 2 in between 0 and 3. Substitute in 8 3 is 24 take away 2 cubed is 8. Subtract and don't forget to put your brackets in 8 times 0 is 0 take away 2 to the power of 0 is 1 on ln 2 and just tidying this up we get 24 take away 8 on ln 2, take away 0 plus 1 on ln 2, which is going to give us the answer, 24 take 7 on ln 2. A new function g of x is found by taking the graph of y equals negative f of negative x and translating it by 5 units to the right. Sketch the graph of y equals g of x showing the x-intercept and the asymptote. All right, so we know that this is equal to 3. Let's have a think about what these are. They're both reflections. This first one is a reflection in the x-axis and this one is a reflection in the y-axis. So we'll start by reflecting this over the x-axis and then we want to reflect it over the y-axis. So it's going to come through like this, goes through negative 3 and the asymptote is down here at negative 8. I'm just going to Get an eraser and rub this one out so it doesn't look confusing. All right, so that's the reflections done. Now we want to translate it five units to the right, which means we're going to add five to this value here. All right, so the graph's going to look something like this. It's going to come through at two. It's still going to have its asymptote at negative eight. I don't know whether it's going to cut the y-axis, but we have not been asked for a y-intercept, so let's not worry about it. And it'll go like that. And that's it. Hence, find the exact value of the integral between 2 and 5 of g of x dx. All right, so having a look at our graph that we drew, here's 5. We want this area here. So the first thing I notice is that we have not been asked for the area. We've been asked for the integral. And because this integral lies below the x-axis, it is going to be negative. 
The second thing I notice is that this area between 0 and 3 is exactly the same size as this area here between 2 and 5. So we work that out in part A. So the integral between 2 and 5 of g of x dx will be equal to negative 24 take away 7 on ln 2 or negative 24 plus 7 on ln 2.